Right. Hey, this is Robert Leiterman with the Bluff Creek Project. Uh, Tate Hernandez is going to be here in and out today. He's got a lot of things going on, but it's going to be Tate Hernandez, myself, Robert Leiterman with the Bluff Creek Project. I should say the Bluff Creek, Bluff Creek Project podcast to be more accurate. And we're, we're lucky to have a Dana Hollyfield with us today. Um, I bought her book and uh, she's from a section of Louisiana. She, she could talk a little bit more about this, but I, I bought her book. It's called The Honey Island Swamp Monster. And it's, it's the documentations. And she, she signed it for me. Yeah. And she says to Robert, hope you enjoy my book. And I did. And and I, I got it from her uh, on, on the uh, November 28th, I think it was. It wasn't that long ago. Yeah, it was a nice, it's a, it's a quick read. It's got a lot of pictures in it. It's got stories in it. And uh, she also likes to cook. And she's got a, several books out there on cooking and, and storytelling. I guess Mermaids is in there too. So with no further ado, uh, uh, Dana Hollyfield, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Okay. I'm Dana Hollyfield from Slido, Louisiana, which is uh, a little town across the lake from New Orleans. Uh, and also borders Pearl River, Louisiana. I grew up in the Honey Island Swamp area with the swamp pretty much in my backyard. Um, and my grandfather was the first eyewitness to report a sighting of the legendary Honey Island Swamp Monster that I wrote about in my books and also made a documentary film about it. Because I, I know you've been busy. Like if I if I Google you and look up your name, you got a lot of stuff going on. Staying busy. Yeah, I do. Besides doing things with the Honey Island Swamp Monster, I've written cookbooks like the Swamp Cooking with the River People. Uh, I, I wrote some some fiction books and and kid kids story books. And I've also my main passion was writing movie screenplays, and I've made hmm. them. And hopefully I'll one day make some that I've written. I, I co-wrote one and film when I was in Los Angeles and uh, co-produced it before I came back to Louisiana. So still writing. Yeah. The screen. I think that's really good. I think you talked about how long ago was that, that you, you went on down to LA and try your luck? Oh, geez. Let's see. It was in the no early nineties. I stayed okay. seven years, came back in 98 and yeah, it was quite an experience. <laughs> a lot different from Louisiana, that's for sure. Oh, I, I can imagine. Yeah, I, actually, I have a, I have some ancestors from Louisiana, southern Louisiana. Uh, Iberia, uh, down out that way, St. Mary's Parish area, mm -hmm. New Iberia area. It's it's like it's like I found out about it uh, not too long ago because my, my mom, she's from a different state. And I, I find I had relatives down there and it was kind of interesting. So I started getting in contact with them and then mm -hmm. they, they all talk funny. Every one of them talks funny. Like yeah. I need a translator sometimes. I'll say, I'm sorry, could you just say that again? And I'm pretty sure they're saying that about me as well. So <laughs> yeah, so, down yeah. In there, it's very Kate, their, their accents a little bit. It's different from where we are in Louisiana. Um, but I have Cajun ancestors down there also in that area. Cajun country. My grand great grandmother was Cajun French down there. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a descendant of Joseph Broussard and his brother Alexander from uh, Nova Scotia. Broussard? I, I have some Broussards in my distant family. <laughs> we might sweet. be. <laughs> yeah. Hey, we could be related. This is kind of funny. Yeah. <laughs> Small world. Yeah. It, yeah, it is. It was, it was interesting because I started doing family history and, uh, <laughs> I find out a lot of people did a lot of work on the Acadians. And that's what we're talking about. We talk about the Broussard group, they had the Acadians. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then they kind of got kicked out of there, kind of about, they kind of left there about, that's 1765, ended up in Louisiana. And mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, Joseph, I think he got, he got, he got, I think he was the brawn behind a lot of the movements and his brother Alexander was the brains behind it. Mm -hmm. But they both headed out and ended up in uh, I Iberia area. And and the rest is history, and they kind of spread around quite a bit. So, yeah. so it's it's kind of interesting on that one because, I mean, ha have you done a lot of research, like checking in on family or? Well, I have a. I actually not so long ago came across. Um, we had a someone in our family had a family hit a tree done, and mm. I got to see a lot of like those names, you know, like 
Thibodeau and Boudreaux. <laughs> we, I have like relatives that actually have those names, you know, like down the line. And we were my great grandfather and their last name was a bear spelled. Oh with, yes. Like, yes. Like That's a familiar Herbert. name down in Iberia. Yeah. Sorry yeah. to interrupt. Like Herbert, but it's set, uh, they pronounce a bear and, um, they were in the from Napoleon Bill, but we were like like going through that family tree. It's like Broussards, out you know, um, Thibodeaux's and Boudreaux's. <laughs> you know, it's like Blanchard's. It's like a lot of people, a lot of those Cajun names were were related to somewhere down oh, the line. Yeah, and then Landry's. Uh, evidently, I got yeah. Landry's in like my line too. Like yeah. I was, when I first started watching the uh, the uh, Swamp People. Uh -huh. And uh, and the Landry name came up. I'm going, God, why does that sound familiar? But uh -huh. yeah, it was it was interesting having that in the background as well. Because mm -hmm. as a kid growing up in South Central Los Angeles, uh, the fascination with swamps and alligators. And now I know why. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of on the DNA there, too. So you pretty much your whole life, you've been pretty much living in, in the Louisiana area. Pretty in slow. I grew up in Slidell, Louisiana. Um, yeah. I grew. Well, I did venture off when I was, I think, about nineteen to Dallas, Texas. Stayed mm -hmm. there about a year and a half. Then came back. Well, first, actually, I went to Scottsdale, Arizona, and then I came back to Louisiana. Stayed a couple of years, and then I went to Los Angeles mm -hmm. in the nineties and stayed almost eight years and got homesick and. I had to come on back, <laughs> miss my well, family. Just and, I always and, back here. Everybody that leaves Louisiana comes back pretty much. That's what I hear. That's what my cousins are telling me. Like I, I had one Peter. We're working on a, a book idea based on family history, and mm -hmm. uh, and and Peter, he was working in Pennsylvania for a long time, and he hardly waited to go back. So he's back now. So he's focusing on a lot of the family history stuff, and he's back. And he kind of said the same thing because he, he always come back. And I, I thought that was kind of cool to hear that because my, my mm -hmm. mom's from uh, East Texas. She's born in East Texas and uh, she, she hadn't been back there yet. But I get to go see those places to meet all these cousins I'm supposed to have that I forgot all about. Never knew I did. And it's kind of cool because every once in a while they'd be sharing some histories and it'd be the same histories my mom told me. You know, it's like all oh, that oral history. It's pretty incredible. Yeah. And I would imagine, though, with the uh, your grandfather having a lot of oral history about his encounters with the uh that the honey swamp monster down down there oh yeah hey yeah uh, i didn't hear yeah. you oh i was just gonna say did your wait, was your was your grandfather kind of interested in it before he had his encounter or, or was it no, he didn't really know there was he they didn't even know about it before the first time he came face with it he was out there hunting on a hunting trip he had him and his co-worker billy mills they used to they actually were pilot he was a pilot um mm -hmm. he had a twin engine airplane and he would fly over the swamp they were looking for a place to build a campsite like where they were good hunting territory so they saw this area that they were gonna build the camp and then they started they'd go by boat the way they found that area by plane i heard the story later was they took a bag of flour and dropped it out on the sandbar so they could find it by boat later on and so that's how they got back to the area with their boat and then they went in and they had to go by like through the sloughs and they went pretty deep in there and then they built a camp so they were going to the camp they had been there many times they were taking equipment in and you know supplies and, <laughs> and that's they came across this thing in the clearing that they had made because they were traveling going back and forth it made like a trail and said this thing was running around and they thought at first it was a wild hog and they were like what is that thing and it heard their voice and stood up turned around and faced them face to face and he he said he had never seen anything like that scary it was, he said it was something that scared the hell out of him, but they were trying to get their guns out of their, they had their guns in their back, uh, the whole uh, packs, however, the gun case, and they were trying to get them out and the thing ran off. And so they, at that time, that's not when he found the tracks. It wasn't until in 74 when he was in the same area because they were always out there hunting and fishing that they, he found tracks by a watering hole, which he 
he figured it was a, its watering hole because there were several tracks found. And then he decided he was going to pour plaster pairs castings. And that's when he called in. He had a friend that worked for the Wildlife and Fisheries. His name was Alvin Frierson that he called in to come look at him to see if he'd ever seen anything like it. And then from there, they sent the tracks to someone they knew at the LSU Zoology Department. And so I guess word got out back then. And then the local news, a, a news person came to talk to him, did a story on it. And uh, from there, he ended up on that show in search of what Len, the one Leonard Nimoy did, which that kind of got it talked about more than just this area and then more people became interested in it and he said it was like monster mania back then people came from everywhere wanting to go hunt it down and he was afraid they were going to shoot each other by accident you know or shoot it and um he just got really interested after that in learning more about this and he started taking his camera with him into the swamp but like my uncle had said before that happened he never they had that camp they were building they never locked the door but after that sighting he started lock he took like a uh, rope and would tie the door shut at night because uh, he knew so he didn't scare him to keep him out of the woods but he, he always from then on ha was had his gun ready just because he said this thing it, it ran from him but he you know at first he looked at it it this the face the way the eyes looked at him it was very he caught, said it was menacing look you know he and it did scare him but you know he said it was like not he he said it was almost looked like it could have been related to orangutan but the face and everything was too human like to where you did you wouldn't want to shoot it because it looked human almost but yet mm -hmm. it had all the hair and the uh, long arms, a broad shoulders, and it ran off on two feet like a human, you know, could have been part human, but um, so, but he, but we didn't know about the film that he shot till when I, back in 2005 when I was making my, well actually it was 2004, I was making my documentary and my grandmother came out with a box of like old eight millimeter tapes because he used to take his camera and you know he got really interested in filming wildlife and on one of the rolls it said it was labeled with mask and tape honey island monster on it she said i don't know what this is but you know you might it might be of use to you so she i said do you have that old projector still and she had it and we watched it you know just as just the way he saw it, and I, f I filmed it for my film just the way uncut so everybody could see exactly the way what he saw walking through. So he obviously got closer than what any of us knew about. He died in 1980, so we didn't even know about this. And I asked my grandmother, you know, why do you think he didn't come forth and tell uh, somebody about this film? And she said, probably because of, for one thing, he was in, trying to do more research on his own and he was scared also that somebody would go in there and try to kill it or you know get killed trying to go after it and she said that's probably why because in, when it first the when they first did the story back in I guess it was in the 70s um, that's when everybody went crazy trying to go in there and just people from all over would come down they'd call them all the time like wanting to know about the monster and so that's what I figured. He just did, didn't want this, you know, people to go in there and just hurt, you know, maybe he didn't want them to kill it. Yeah, I, I can understand that because it's like once you start telling people, you can't control, everybody wants to know where it is and you don't want to give out the location. And I, I, yeah, flash, I'm trying to visualize when, when, you're, when you're telling the story about your grandpa. I'm trying to visualize. So when he first arrives there, yeah, I, I got him dropping these these flower by these flower bombs out of an aircraft, right? And yeah. I wonder how many times he had to drop it to actually hit it on, on the shoreline. I don't know because <laughs> my mom <laughs> said she when she was a little girl, she used to ride, he used to fly her to Napoleonville from Angie. They lived in Angie, Louisiana, and he'd fly her over there for the summer. And she said that you know he. He'd get close, you know, like, I guess at one point, too, she said he had to land in a field somewhere be 
So I guess he was skilled at getting um, where he <laughs> needed to go. He was a pilot in the in the he was in the Air Force. Or I guess it was, it was back then we found some paperwork that was it looked like Army, but it said Air Force. So I always thought maybe that's where he flew, learned to fly at. Um, and then he became an air traffic controller. Oh. So, so that's that is- what he was doing when he when he had had the sighting he was working as an air traffic controller okay that makes sense because like the, the army air corps yeah they, they had it was the army but they flew planes they were the air corps yeah so and, and that that was that was kind of the first start of the air force i guess you could say that yeah so so he was like a bush pilot skill set wise being able to land on fields and make sharp turns and fly low and yeah at least he is not dealing with a bunch of tall redwood trees so that, that's not too yeah. bad yeah. yeah. So, so he, he drops, he drops the flower, he marks the spot and then he, he's, let's, let's, go, let's go find our hunting's place. So, so they go in there. So he would have to, I'm assuming the cabin was not right off the water. It was in a bit. No, it had, it was a place that was, um, he said you had to get there by boat, take, park your boat, drag your boat over the lateral canal. I always heard about the lateral canal and drag it in, you know, a little ways. And then they had a smaller boat that I guess they kept that they drug deeper they had to they so they could put that in those ponds and stuff they had out there. Um, so maybe the b- bigger boat that they couldn't get there. I know they had like a small one that they kept out there and they were bringing a motor or they brought a motor too to put on the boat. So a lot of those, they had to walk a ways to the campsite. So okay. it was trail after, so they were pretty deep in in the honey out so nothing was easy it's like Um, several trips hauling that stuff in and they're hauling all this junk in trying to get camp set up and that's kind of when they had their sighting do you remember what year that was in 63 63 yeah i was born in 61 so that was a while ago yeah Yeah, i I can imagine people going are we seeing what we think we're seeing yeah (laughs) right now yeah there, there were stories about about swamp teachers prior to your grandfather having this encounter correct you mean like movies and stuff no no i mean like no i mean like stories in terms of like in that geographic area uh having history some oral history about it and then not taking it seriously until you experience it i mean were were there were there a bunch of oral history stories running around at the time after he had come forth with his sight the sighting then other there was some other locals that had said they had a similar experience okay. they called ted williams old they called him old man williams he was an old trapper and he claimed that he used to see him swimming in pairs they had wow. him on the show in search of also where he talked about how they would swim nearby and they get out and um, they didn't bother him, so he didn't bother them. But he was one that came up missing in the swamp. And they found his boat, but they didn't find him for a long time anyway. I, I heard, I always thought that they never found him. But about a couple of years ago, I got contacted by supposedly his grand, one of the grandchildren who said they actually did find his body. But they knit, she didn't know how he died or mm. so. That was news to me. When I first wrote the book, I didn't know that. We always thought he had never been found, but um, they did eventually find his body, she says. But um, she said that she didn't know. How, they didn't say how he died. And then oh. there was another There was another man I've learned that went in there, and he never was found again. And he, his grandson contacted me a couple of years ago and said that, the story his great grandmother told him was well she she she, i guess it come from the great grandmother that told the mom and then he you know he heard the story but the grandfather supposedly found the den and he come in got his gun and said he was gonna go in there and get get it like and then he never come back and i said well why didn't what you know what was this ever discussed you know she's he said that the grandmother the great grandmother didn't want to, you know, make people think that, that he was crazy, but he has, they still to this day, as far as we know, his body, nothing was ever found. And then the grandson told me, he's like, well, I, I know where this den is. I could take you to it. But then 
I don't know if he went like he might have went to jail or something. I haven't been able to get in touch with him again. I tried oh. to con he contacted me through like message on Facebook. And then when I contacted him a while back, you know, to ask him, would he be willing to talk about that on camera? At first, he when he first contacted me, he says, don't use my name. Don't my family would be really mad at me for telling the story. But but um, so but I had actually heard about his grandfather going missing before I ever knew him, talked to him years ago by someone else that was a swamper out there. And, and he had told me, yeah, he got too close. So I used to tell him you're getting too close. And then so when the grandson contacted me, I said, well, maybe it's true because I'd heard that from the other old guy out there that had told told me about him going missing and had seen it and said he'd seen it and knew where it was. And I said, so uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe something like that could have happened. And he, they, and he said also his grandmother told oh, yeah. him that they were moonshiners. So they didn't want people going in their territory to start, you know, messing around. So that could have been why they didn't want to report to the authorities that he was like you know come up missing because of something crazy like that so. which yeah that 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 could very well be people are protected of their areas yeah yeah, yeah we, we like in big sur we, yeah we have in big sur i worked in big sur for four years as a park range one of my assignments and we we got a call for a body recovery because uh, somebody found somebody that, that was deceased for a, a couple of years. And, and so we find out that that location was near where one of the homeless guys was living. And he didn't, he didn't want to, he knew it was there, but he didn't want to give up his location. And so we stumbled upon it by accident. So I, I can understand people not wanting to uh, tell people about their spots, but it, it's like missing a loved one. It'd be nice to like, let people know. But that, that was crazy. Big Sur was kind of crazy at times there. And I, I guess the place the place you talk about is it's, it's off the Pearl River, right? It's like the yeah. boundary of Louisiana and Mississippi, right? Right. It's border, and then we also have well, the Honey Island Swamp borders Louisiana, and Mississippi, and on the other side of the wildlife management area, they have the Stennis test test site, which um, but it's like a buffer zone, so. The swamp goes for miles and miles, and then on the other side, there's this, you know, where they do te they test rockets and all. There used to be a theory, mm -hmm. oh, but they might have created something in a test tube and it got out and the guy escaped in the swamp. Maybe that's what this thing is, you know. So, well, anyway, oh. could be an alien too. I don't know because <laughs> I have <laughs> some UFO out there, and my uh, we were all all the whole family saw it. So it wasn't just some one person's imagination. We saw it was a, a campsite that we had up in Angie, Louisiana, which is about probably an hour from here. And it connected too with the this swamp. And there was a we were all sitting on the porch after supper and they had a light shining like something over the river, round, shining blue light down on the water. Then it moved up. Then it came over us, and then it took off and went straight up in the air and disappeared. It's like, as so we thought, well, that must have been a UFO. That was back when I was probably like 12. Wow. 12 how, close, how close did I get to, to you guys? It was pretty close. I mean, we, we, the, the river from our, where we were on the porch was probably 200 yards okay. and then moved over us. It was like, just we could look right up, see all the lights, and then it just, and I could still remember like it was yesterday, and it shot straight up and went and disappeared. So, and it was probably 10 of us there. So, we, you know, we all saw it. Well, uh, if you were to guess the size, I know sometimes it's hard to guess sizes at night, distances. I mean, I mean if you were to guess, how large would you say that? That it, you said pretty much a blue light, right? The, it was blue light. It, over there was shining with, blue light down on the river, but when it come over us, okay, I say it's probably if I had to guess about it was bigger than a helicopter. That's for sure. But it it was I don't know, probably about the size of a house, <laughs> like a normal. Well, I guess 
my house, which is probably 2,000 square feet, maybe. I don't know. It's, okay. It was pretty big. I mean, but it, you know, wasn't, it wasn't like the size of a football field or anything, but it was pretty no, big. Okay. Wait, did it make any noise at all? Was it quiet? Was it, uh, whistling it wind? Really, it didn't really make a lot of noise, at least from what I can remember. It, it's just it was just shining the light then it come over and then it just went up and was gone just like that just like that and and we were all like you know my mom i, I still talk I told we talked me and my mom talked about it the other day so she i said you remember that she said yeah like it was yesterday yeah have you have you heard any other reports of that since since you guys experienced that um, well, there was another time when, uh, my dad and his cousin were hunting out there. He swears that, and you know, he's, my dad's getting really old now. So his memory's getting, but I talked to him about it about a year ago and he talked about, it was, he said he was, him and his cousin were out there and they were walking through the swamp and this big gold shaped object was kind of hovering over the swamp and it and wherever they went it just sort of followed them and then he said he squatted down by a tree because he figured well you know they didn't know where they were out in the middle of the swamp and he said tom went by like a whole day and then it was da almost dark when they all, all of a sudden and then so i said well you might have been abducted you know he still he goes i see he said, I see what happened and but my cousin told the same version and he's like oh, yeah that did happen so i said well maybe there's something going on out there in that swamp and that thing that they've seen might be who knows it might be something come from something like that I, yeah it's ufos unidentified, unidentified flying object and it could be light or some something metallic or, or still that that is strange because when you're out there by yourself and it's and, and there's nobody else around and you start having these experiences to make you make you wonder about you know what what's really going down here. Now, yeah. uh, I gotta ask you this: Share what's the swamp gas? <laughs> I don't know. Like, I you heard. Still there? I, yeah, I, I don't think it was. <laughs> it could have been. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's yeah, funny because that's one of the big gas. things people. Oh yeah. Yeah, I, I brought it up just to be funny, not not to be you know sarcastic or anything. It's yeah, it's just no. it's one of those things you hear about is the, the, the lights and the swamp gas. They say, well, it was just the swamp gas, you know, whatever. But I haven't experienced the uh, the southeast yet. I've been pretty much on the west coast and a lot of places there. I, since the time up in Wisconsin, northern Wisconsin, pretty country. I still mm -hmm. watching up there, and I've I've seen lights. I'll admit to that. I've seen things that are flying along without making noises that aren't supposed to be there and I, I don't know what they are but i guess they would be unidentified flying objects because they're in the air i guess if it's in the water it's, and it goes underwater it's, it's an unidentified submerged object but until we figure out what they are I, it just makes you wonder and the lights you know in the swamps and stuff that it's it's strange even on the west coast we, we've seen some lights moving along through the forest and it, it just doesn't seem right. You know, it's like, why is that there? Why are we seeing this? And it's almost like floating along, minding its own business. Mm -hmm. But I've never seen anything huge in terms of light wise, you know, through the forest, just small, smaller stuff, you know. And some people say, oh, you're crazy. And some people say, you know, you're making stuff up. Some people just say, well, I've been there for years. And I've never seen any of that stuff. So I, I consider that you're blessed. You've got a chance to see something that most people don't get to see. And there's usually a reason for that. I guess you'll have to figure out what that is. Why, 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 why you're the person or your group, or why that geographic area, why, why are you having these things, you know, take place around you? And uh, when was the first time you decided to go out looking for the, uh, Honey Island Swamp Monster. What was the first? And when when did you think, hey, you know, we should go look for it? Well, and, and why? We have a camp out in the Honey Island Swamp that we still. I, when I first came back from California, and my dad was always out there before he got sick, and my brother was always out there. So then 
I started going out there again. And, um, and then I was married, I got married to some, someone that had a camp right next to my dad's. He was the one, he was on that show swamp people. So <laughs> well, he was a big swamper. So we were always out in the swamp and, uh, I had met some local people, at, you know, just being out there all the time, people that would come to our camp because we'd have a lot of crawfish bowls or, you know, cook out cooking hogs and whatever. And, uh, I'd hear about somebody had a site, you know, in a similar encounter. So I'd talk to them about it. And then I thought, well, I'm going to start just, I just started bringing, I, I like to do photography. I always had my camera. So I started asking, well, can I get your story on camera? And then that's, so I got interested in, you know, meeting other people that had had a similar experience. So I thought, well, that's why I wanted to write the book. And I, I started, you know, keeping my eye out because when when you go out there and they would go hunting frogs at night or whatever, you never know what you're gonna come across. So I always took my camera, hoping I would see it or see see evidence. Because you know I remembered my grandfather's story. I remember him talking to me about it. You know, and him how serious he was. He's like he he never strayed from what he said, and he was determined. I remember as a child him going out there still looking for it. I remember him taking a goat. He was going to stake a goat out there as bait. And of course, we were terrified as children because we'd play with the goat all day. And he's like, going to take uh -huh. the like, oh, oh, my God. And that's probably, he said he would tie the goat. He'd sit up in a tree blind and wait. And then, of course, he brought the goat home because the thing didn't take the bait. And he would say, like, must be smarter than we are. Or, you know, he's just a tearing or something but um i just when i was meeting all these people i thought well i'm you know let's go look for evidence and so there every, we would go out there and look for tracks or um but just being out there whether i was with my family hunting and fishing or you know you just i just kind of always look around like wait you know hoping to see some kind of evidence or maybe see it standing out between the cypress trees but um i haven't been lucky enough to see it myself i have seen tracks i have heard things out there that scared me to death because it had that that sound that's just not anything like you ever heard before and um there was a time when i when my daughter was a baby and at the time my husband at the time went across the river with my son he my son was probably at the six or seven years old at that time and they would go coon hunting at night and they left me and my baby the baby at the camp by herself and the river was high at that time so i could hear so i was sitting out in the porch and i could hear something walking through that water like and it didn't sound like it just sounded like something moving so I went inside the camp with her and then it something hit the back, hit the back of the camp really hard. And I, and it, I was like, Oh no, you know, and, and I'm, you feel very vulnerable because y'all know we we're on an Island. There was nowhere to go. And the water was surrounding me. Uh, you know, I couldn't go very far on land because the river was so high. So I just had to wait for them to get back. Luckily they didn't stay too long, but, and then another time, uh, my friends, some friends of, of mine, and this is kind of before I ever really got to really look and, and doing the, the film. Um, I just come back from California and we were at, uh, they had a camp up river and, and the guys decided they were going to go off frog. It was probably frog and whatever. And they left me, it was me and two of my friends out there and they have had the campfire and, and we're sitting around the girls were sitting on a campfire. And then all of a sudden we hear something in those woods behind us. And, and the, my friend, she's like, she had heard since it was her camp, she had heard this before. And she's telling me, that's what I've been telling you about. And I'm like, and I, and I remember, I start thinking about my grandfather, what happened, what he saw and what other people had claimed to seen. And I was like, we need to go inside. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I am, 
I don't want to sit out here by this campfire by ourselves, you know. So we went in the camp and and at that another time I felt like something either they either threw a stick at the camp or hit the side of the camp and it scared us to death. We we're like, you know, but um finally the guys come back like, why you let the fire go out? And I'm uh-huh. like, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I know what's out in the woods, but so I've had quite some experiences like that. Um, and then on a camping trip when we were, um, my husband at the time was on small people and they wanted us to go out there on one of the episodes called full moon fever to where we, they wanted us to go look for the honey island swamp monster. And they did an interview with me about my grandfather. So we took the two camera guys. I don't think that they had filmed a lot like, alligator stuff on the main river for, for the show, but they hadn't really ventured deep into the spot on foot. Like we, we were going to take them. And, and so where, where we went, it was like, we got there too kind of too late because we didn't have much time to build a camp. Uh, I mean, a tent. So we had a trek in, we got dropped off by one of our friends and we trekked them in there probably about, we had to walk about 30 minutes, 45 minutes to get to where we were camp. And we set up tent really fast and built a fire and, and something threw a, a stick towards us. And they were like that wood knocking or near, you know, we heard that. And then those two camera guys, they actually, I could tell they were starting to get nervous and, <laughs> Like you were out here in the middle of the, nowhere. And that night when we finally went in our tent, I wasn't going to sleep. I said, there is no way in hell I'm going to sleep tonight because I know what I, you know, I know too much about the, all these sightings out here. So uh, they had a, the top of the tent had a screen where I could see out and I was laying down and I, every now and then I get up, tr- look through the screen, but then, and the camera guys had already went to bed, you know, they didn't, nobody, everybody was trying to go to bed. And then, so later in the night, I hear something walking around the, t- like two feet. It wasn't like a hog rutting around. And I was like, wait, trying to wake up. My husband said, go out there, look for this thing and see what this is. And and he go, go back to sleep. It's probably a, it's just a hog. <laughs> I'm like, no, it's, yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's a two-legged hog. Hog don't walk on two feet like this. So, he got up, went around, and it was like he come back and said, "Oh, it's just rabbit. It's a rabbit." I said, "Rabbit don't sound like that." And uh, <laughs> the next Bigfoot. morning, they had put they had put uh, trail cams up, like the wildlife uh, cameras, high in the mm-hmm. tree. So we got up early, about probably like six, as soon as daylight came, really, and took the cameras and we left and went back to our camp. And then while we were viewing it, you could see on one of the frames as if some hair you could see hair on it it leaned over like it maybe leaned over and caught the top of of some part of its body whatever it was it was trying to see what that camera was and i said that's probably it probably was looking like you know saw the camera in the tree uh and wanted to know what it was but that so that was kind of a interesting because not that stick that came sailing over towards us it was like this thing i've heard from other eyewitnesses kind of a territorial creature he's very like he this one eyewitness said that he was out there and had a generator plugged in and this thing come up unplugged his generator he went out he thought well well, my generator is full of gas so he went out there and when he got to where his generator was he saw this thing towering over and he just started back he backed up went ran back to his camp locked the door and he said he looked out the window and it got up in a tree so he said he had a flare gun and he shot the flare gun out the out towards to try to scare it off and he said it wouldn't leave till about daylight and then and he said after that he didn't go back to his camp for like two years <laughs> and i was like wow. i don't think either but but i've heard other people that have Experiences like my uncle and, and they took his wife out there and, and that he was one that was on the search of it said it started circling them and they had to build a fire around them and they started beating on things to scare it away but and my aunt 
she had told me that when she saw my uncle starting to carve a stick into a weapon, when she they would they said it was so close you could almost hear it breathing. And she said when she saw her husband do that, that's when she knew they might be in trouble. And they started building the fire around them. And so it's like maybe it's territory. I don't want people too close to where it is out there. Maybe. And and this this isn't too far. All this is going on not too far from your place, right? Yeah, well, I live where my house is it's probably three minutes from the boat launch. And once you mm -hmm. get in the boat, our camp's another three minutes up the river. And then if you go like Honey Island, the actual uh, the wildlife management's probably I think it's like seven miles long. And then but the Honey Island Swamp goes on into another swamp called Bogachitta. Mm. But way back in, in the, I think it was in the six, probably when my grandfather had his encounter, they considered that swamp from what I, I was told that that was also called Honey Island, but they, they split it and changed the name to Bogachitta. So they have all these swamps that connect that this thing can mm -hmm. migrate, travel, you know, along, there's lots of territory for it to roam and and there's more than one which i heard there's more than one and plus my grandfather found more than one size track he found like five different sizes like like little ones and you know like as if it would have which makes sense if it's some, something out there that's been right. there a long time breeding and right I, I i i hear that the area that whole area there is one of the last uh swamp areas that still look there so that's still in really good condition that hasn't been messed up over harvested and that's what I, that's what i hear about that whole area there so that they, sounds pretty cool they had made the pearl river see it used to be a river that they uh brought like big tugboats and stuff down to up and down but then they changed that and made it a scenic river so then it mm. became it became where they couldn't take the big boats up there anymore and usually just used for fish and hunting and fishing. Yeah, I, I, it's on my list to go check out because I think the Native Americans up there used to collect, well, pearls. That's what he used to call Pearl River. Right. They said they have a lot of those black, I guess it's the black pearls, maybe. I've heard they have black pearls in that river. And I, uh, and I remember my brother telling me a story that they had a man they had a house, I think he had a houseboat on the river and he was cultivating and he got, they came and made him stop. Like he was, he was had a little thing going where he was getting the pearls out of the oyster, of the, I mean the clams. And, yeah. Five, five elves. Yeah. But they made the, the, I guess it was the wildlife and fishers, whoever controls that, they made him stop doing that. They, they said he wasn't allowed to do that, but they do. They, I can imagine. imagine. I, I realized. Huh? Yeah. I, well, I was going to say, I, 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 I did fishing game stuff while I was working as a ranger. Yeah. There are specs of size. You got to make sure they're a certain size, take them a certain time of year. So I, I, I can imagine, especially something like that, that there's leaves behind, like that little dust particle gets mooshed all over the place till it turns into a nice little pearl. And uh, I can see people that wanting to get a hold of that and, it's got to keep everything from being over harvested. Make sure it's it's doing good and the resources there. Yeah, I, I got a few questions for you, I, and I know you talk about the track. How would you describe the uh, the track? I guess the first one your your grandpa was in, in nineteen seventy four. I think you said. Uh, how would you describe it? Like size, length, distance well, between each stripe. I would. The ones that he poured were like. 11 12 inches long they weren't huge like a big watch bigfoot track but they and they they're they were probably probably a little bit bigger than the average man's foot but it's but they had the web three web toes and a fourth little dew claw on the the side but so and they have an arch in them and the heel like like okay. a human heel and the arch and the, the long toes so in that there this thing lives in a swamp maybe the web that would have adapted to have these type of web toes if that is webs that um to live in a swamp yeah and they it's have, easier to walk on mud yeah 
And then um, there was a a man that was sort of like a cryptozoologist study. He he came and looked at him and told me he thought they could it could climb for sure, which made sense because I'd heard other eyewitnesses talk about it climbing up in a tree. So. Would you say it like that? You said the dew claw. Would that be more like an opposable thumb, sort of? Yeah, like on the yeah, a little thumb. Yeah, interesting. And do you remember the stride length, like the stepping for stride length? Or uh, step, yeah. When I when we saw tracks, it looked it was a pretty. I don't know. I never measured it, but it was a good like a something tall took a big step so i don't really i'm probably like three feet i don't i don't, I don't really well, remember i didn't i didn't measure it we well, were yeah, out, I, yeah. so it's, it's so it's it's a good it's, it's a good stride lift so it's not like 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 uh bears bears kind of short little strides you know because mm -hmm. they got four legs moving it's kind of short bipedal mm -hmm. people tend to take a little bit bigger of the stride so so yeah, so so it, it's not a, so it's not a short step. It's like a, a decent step, and uh, it, it, any drag marks associated with that? Because I I know an uneven terrain though. You sink in, you pull your foot out. Sometimes you drag it a little bit. Are you are you were you finding these tracks in mud, or you're finding them just kind of like in a, a clay, wet clay type soils? You mean the footprints? Yeah, the other tracks. It was mostly like in wet mud but there there was some that were in where it would have been muddy when the water was dropping out and then they got hard because some of that mud will mm. get real hard like cement out yeah. there oh yeah interesting and and how, how often do you see these tracks not often i mean i have had people uh, one or two people over the years caught like say hey come look at this you know we saw this out like a friend of mine that has a camp out there she's like come look at this um and when we when i found them when we were out there it was only that one time really that found a good set other, by ourselves but you know other than being told where somewhere to go look so when we were out looking that was you know probably in 2004 well yeah and I, I i gotta ask this question because a lot of people are listeners going well how does she know she didn't see an alligator track? Well, well, I think the alligators tracks. They're they're heel like if they put a, a mark, they don't have that real long like arch and like a foot mm -hmm. like a, their foot's a little bit. Their heel to me looks like it's more like a handprint, like you know, and then. There's never a drag like a tail dragging behind it. Right. You know, he's going to be dragging if he's on, and he's going to be pulling his tail behind him, which would right. you'd see that if it was in the mud with the. I would think you would see that also. Besides, um, and then and then where these some of these tracks were further up, you know, they weren't by the water, so. Oh, like, yeah, that's long. I know alligators do get out to lay their eggs yeah. and stuff, but they yeah. don't go too far. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and they're usually going to have more, like, uh, they're going to have more legs, you know, I mean, more paws. Four it's, legs instead of two. Yeah. they got to have four instead of two, so. Yeah. And how, how, would you, how would you describe the difference between the heels in case somebody sees a track out there? Uh, uh, now is the alligator more of a narrow heel in the back and the and the other in the other yeah, tracks? Yeah, I, I think that the from what I've seen looking them up online too is uh, the alligator the the heel part's a little bit shorter and a little bit more narrow. It looks like, mm -hmm. and I think they might have more than three. I'm not sure if they have more finger like to toes. Yeah. In this thing, like, like on our, I'll, I'll use our bear. I, I'm pretty sure you have bears out your way too. I know we have. That's a big thing we have out our way, and a lot of people misinterpret the, like the bear tracks, or sometimes a double tap the people tracks. But our, you know, our bears, black bears, they got more of a, a more of a narrow here, 
heel versus uh, uh, people got more roundy heel. A lot of the Bears ones, they're like more narrow in the back and the foot's mm -hmm. kind of shaped a little bit different. And, and uh, you, you could tell the difference. Uh, well, most people can. Uh, there's a few people who don't. And that's that one arch thing. And then the Bears kind of like their foot kind of breaks in different parts as it, you know, the way it's designed. And you can mm -hmm. see whether it's a ball tap or whether it's the heel location. And sometimes the bears will step on their, 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 their same tracks. It makes the uh -huh. tracks look larger. Um, on these tracks, do, do you ever see it where it steps upon its tracks again, or are they just totally separate? Well, the one, the one time that when we did see those, like that was walking, like taking a few steps over till it got mm -hmm. to another uh, slew of water. I don't really recall them being like stepped on, like it was walking around maybe in the same spot or anything. It just was walking like it went straight to that water and crossed yeah. over. Yeah. Well, it's, it's interesting because uh, bears have four legs and so they're bound to step on top of their prior tracks, but mm -hmm. having two legs, you got to work hard to step on your own tracks unless you're following somebody and there's I mean, people are following a line like bears use a lot of same paths over and over again. And so you get this compacted area that's over rounded. Sometimes you can't see the details, but you can see the impressions where they go. Now, would you say that there's areas up there that are pretty much game trails and a lot of it sounds like it's flooded a lot, but I'm pretty sure things don't like to spend a lot of time swimming all the time. Do you guys have like game trails like bears or mountain lion pathways that you guys see? quite often not really no i think and then that swamp get gets so overgrown with foliage and then we have the hurricanes that come through and the uh flooding like the water just now went down from being high for so long where you can't get out on much land and and um the i guess the river when it's go washing across the land like that it just kind of you know changes things it, nothing really stays the same for too long. Well, is is your is your place on stilts? I mean, do you worry about it flooding and stuff? Yeah, well, our camp, my dad's camp, it's built up a little bit, not too high, but it was the ground at one time. It was uh, much higher than where the river rose, but now the bank in front of it's been washing away over the years. So now we're afraid it's going to, in like probably another year or two, that camp will probably get unless they go in there and try to raise it, move it. But my brother and them mm -hmm. think it's going to probably get taken by the river because the whole front where we used to have a pavilion out there and it's gone and wow. we've saved it by putting that. Uh, my cousin keeps dragging up logs and trying to block the water from r washing the bank away. But that just happens out there on the river, the sandbars that you, you might see a sandbar in the next week you go out there and it's gone it's like wow. yeah it's and like the drop you might swim in a sandbar and then there's the drop off like the, the water will just you'll know, walk out there and drop off and and it just the bottom of that river because of the currents and all, i guess mm -hmm. it changes you just never know and so yeah i've had friends out there this camps had it it's totally got washed away of you know they had to just go build like build further in and you know and because the river changes so much yeah do you have to gps your location so you can find it again how, how do you guys navigate <laughs> back there of all the changes Lucky, going on yeah now when my son goes out, out in the swamp i have him on that 360 i could see where he's at in case he would get lost or broke down or whatever and i thank god for that 360 because i've had to send people to get him a few times <laughs> that that'd be one of those things it's like uh, uh you know you, not having your landmarks memorized and in, in, in the water channels going wherever they want and yeah. you're going through tunnels of vegetation and, and then you're out and about you're having a great time and then you have to okay I, I gotta go back now and you're like where's back right it's easy to get turned around out there that's for sure oh yeah you go on in circles for hours and not know it <laughs> Right, you keep going back to the same place. That I've heard would be one thing. That, that happened too. Oh, that that'd be one thing that would worry me. Like, okay, let's leave early so we have time. So we want to be stuck out there in the night, getting lost. 
Mm-hmm. Has, that ever, has that ever happened to you? You went out and then you're, oh, I'm going to be out for a couple hours. Next thing you know, you're kind of, you get a little confused and you have to spend the night in a place you're not so familiar with. Has that happened to you? Not to me, but to some of my family members <laughs> and oh. friends there. But but I remember after Hurricane Katrina came and just totally tore the swamp up. And we, my brother and his friend took me in a boat and we were going to go check out how much damage really got done out there. And, and we ended up, it was like nothing looked the same at all. And, and there was no, like the, the waterways that we would have normally found, like couldn't find them. And then I, we could see helicopters, like rescue people going over. And at one point I'm like, we might have to wave them in because we were like way out there and they, and they, their boat hit some, the motor got bogged down in some mm. vine stuff and we were out there and there was oil and all this stuff mixed up from, I guess the, the surge waters had brought in and, and I'm thinking we're going to be stuck out here in the middle of nowhere. Nobody knows where we are. Cause I didn't have the, we didn't have the phone back then in the boat. Mm. Um, it was just, it was a very scary feeling because, and then of course, at one point they're playing a joke on me to make me think we're really going to be broke down for hours. So, well, we got <laughs> our e out here. We got one and I got a bottle of Jim Beam. I said, I'm not, I said, y'all might need that to keep the mosquitoes away. I don't know. And <laughs> get the, rub, rub mud all over you to, at, at night. And then eventually they got the motor going and I was get me back home <laughs> but oh. before dark nothing like a good dark, adventure in the dark out there like in the daylight you can look around and not see hardly any alligators at night when you look around with a light you see about a hundred eyes around the boat looking at you <laughs> and so you <laughs> wouldn't get out in that water fall over board at that must be, that must be trippy and you guys have you guys have those uh, uh Fireflies too out out your way, right? Fireflies, yeah. yeah. You said I can imagine ha- having those flying around, glowing green, and then yeah. and then yeah, then the lights off, catching the eyes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and Boy, they, they flies are really bad sometimes a year when you're going. You just they'll just cover you. It's just horrible, like millions of mayflies. And if you have lights on, they they go to the light and. Mm. They're over, all over everything. So, so when is the worst time of year to be out uh, out out in the swamps down there? Probably the hottest part of the year, the summertime. <laughs> it gets really, really hot out there, and at night with the mosquitoes and the, it's muggy and you know. So I'd probably say August, maybe July, August. Well, August is probably the worst. Okay. For heat. Note to it, self. You don't want to suffocate at night out there, but probably the best time if you were going to come and explore would probably be the fall. Okay. Yeah. Or spring, spring good. I mean, yeah. right before it gets really hot. Yeah. And they're just with trees. Uh, the bald cypress, I know they, they turn kind of orange to golden colors. That's kind mm-hmm. of cool. And, uh, if, if I were to go in the spring, what would be a good time in the spring, April? Or does that just depend on, on how much rain? It depends on the rain and the if the river is high and, you know, if it comes up and, you know, just kind of watch. And sometimes, you know, the up above us when in Jackson, if they open the um, the locks and let the water, you know, we always worry when they open waterways, it's going to come down on us and flood the river here. But but I would say probably April, May, before it gets really hot. Okay. But, but then again, that time of the year, sometimes the water's high too. So it just it just depends. Just check first and make sure. Um, yeah. That we're not having a storm or. Yeah, especially after this winter, a lot of that you know, we get a lot of good precipitation. At least here on the west coast, we are. Mm-hmm. A lot of rain, like going up the Bluff Creek. You know, we have we have this big project we're going to be doing hiking up the creek, and um, I keep telling them like, you know, there's a lot of debris going to fall down those hills, and you're going to have to be climbing through these river canyons with debris and new boulders. What part of uh, well, California is it? Well, this will be up in uh, Humboldt and Del Norte County. 
the film uh, site for the Bluff Creek where the Patterson film was filmed was in Southern Del Norte County. And okay. uh, this time of year, area gets snow at higher elevation, gets lots of rain, and it's it's known known to take a lot of water. So uh, it's got a kind of interesting history. Because we kind of have our Patterson film uh, uh -huh. taken taken by a film, probably very similar to the one your your your, your grandpa did in yeah. a silent film. So uh -huh. yeah. I say all Patterson film was one of those quiet ones just to film in it. Had Patty walking down and Roger Patterson's filming in Bob Ginland's kind of his escort. And that, that's kind of what some of our Bigfoot related stories, you know, the term Bigfoot was from, from tracks and, and uh, early, early on. And I, I'd like to ask you some more wildlife questions. Like what, what kind of animals would you expect to be seeing out there in, in that, that part of the world? He, well, you have uh, alligators, of course, turtles, mm -hmm. uh, snapper turtles, moccasins, um, bobcats. Every, you don't see a lot of them, but they are out there. Um, I've, we've seen, they say black panthers, but uh, someone told me that that's probably jaguars because they look black to the light hits them a certain way. And then, then you can see the markings, but other people claim, though, no, they're full black panthers out there. I've had a few friends who have actually seen big, big black cats that they call black panthers. Um, they do have black bear, but it's their smaller black bear than what you'd see up in the mountains. Um, eagles. They got big eagle nests. Um, we have egrets and pelicans and deer, wild boar. Coons, um, let me think. <clears throat> squirrels. <laughs> I, yeah, I got squirrels. Yeah, I, I can imagine though the wild boar being huge up that way. Oh yeah, they get my my cousin one time. He killed one that was five hundred two pounds, it's like a record because of the size of the tusk. They were hog hunting, and it, it killed his dog. He, his lab got killed. It was a shame, but um that was they were they it was a record size boar so um but that they so plentiful in that swamp they take over everything so um you got to be really careful because if they come in packs they'll come in packs and you'll have to get up in the trees i remember when we was little my dad put us up in the tree we were camping out and he put us in the trees because a pack of wild boar were coming and, and we had to wait till they left they hung around a while and then they finally went on their way but they're very dangerous and and um they got those long tusks that are so sharp they could shred newspaper wow if if you, if you would estimate the size of those guys in terms of this what, 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 would, what would a big boar be a big size wise about two and a half feet at the shoulders three <sighs> if you were to well, get that, i've seen them out there that probably about two three feet shoulder from shoulder to sh you know width and height was i would say about probably three four feet i you know pretty big and they and then of course they have the little babies that multiply very quickly and but the if they're in the packs like that and you hear them coming and squealing and you better get out, get out of there, get up high. Yeah, somewhere. yeah. that's they crazy. They say they will eat bones and all. <laughs> no evidence left behind. Right. <laughs> and, they, and they got all those mouths to feed. Yeah. Yeah. They're that, aggressive. That, I heard stories about that. Those wild boars, and it, it's just like kind of intimidating. And th th they'll they'll jump in the water too, right? Oh yeah, they swim. They have a, a swamp tour in the area that takes the, their tourists along in the slough and these hogs these wild hogs they've gotten so used to being fed the marshmallows and all they throw out there the gators <laughs> how the hogs come up they'll almost get in the boat with you but wow. you know and they they want, want the marshmallow but you know that's and it's scary because if you go out there in a little, little boat to fish in that slough those hogs can are bigger than the boat almost and getting the boat witch and tip you over. So 
that's the bad part about this tours feeding the, those type of animals because then they're not scared just like the big alligators they yeah. got huge alligators that they feed in that area for the tourists and then those same alligators when there's not the tour boats coming they go they might decide they were hungry and they're not scared to go up to boats now i had a friend whose son was in a kayak and he was going near that area because they had a camp down there and he he called his dad he said dad i got a big alligator on my trail and he's coming after me and his dad jumped in the boat and the gator was probably a 13 foot gator and the cop bigger than the kayak coming right behind him and um the dad got there and tom with the bigger boat you know scared you know made the big gator go you know leave him alone but that was pretty scary. And, and then his dad contacted the tours and was like, y'all stop feeding these gators. You're going to call somebody to get eaten out here. But man, that sounds like a scene from Peter Pan. TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like to kayak. I don't do as much now, but you know, that's something on my, it'd be on my bucket list would be to an area like that to, to paddle around, to hear the silence. But yeah. it sounds like that, that comes with some risks. Yeah, there's a girl then um, up above our camp of Bo or in Porter's River does a kayak and tour business and she takes people on a tour through that area. It's really beautiful back there. Yeah. Or at least she used to. I don't know if she's still doing it, but she she used to do that. And um, people would she would take like big groups out there or just one or two people and give them a tour. And she was pretty knowledgeable of the area. Yeah, you, you think having more people together, like if you're in kayak, would be a great deterrence for some of those marshmallow-friendly alligators? <laughs> I, I would stay in the up where, where I like in the quarters, because down there by the other end is where all those tour boats go, where those mm -hmm. big alligators are. So if you got kayak, I wouldn't kayak down there where the tour boats go because those alligators. They might come and try to tip you over or something. They they try to come steal my marshmallows. Yeah, you bring some bring some chicken legs and throw it out to them. Maybe they'll leave you alone. Yeah, it's a decoy. Yeah, we were hiking a section of the Pacific Crest Trail, and uh, we were we were high school, and we weren't too bright, but we we're having a great time. And we spent a week out there, and we weren't afraid of the bears because we had it all figured out. We had a honey grenade, so the plan was. When we saw a bear, you know, you unscrew the lid of the honey jar and you toss it in the opposite direction and then you boogie. And, and that was our plan. We never had we never had implemented, but that was probably one of the stupidest plans we could think of. But that's 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 all that's all we could think of. <laughs> which which is it's, it's, it's kind of funny when you think about it. Uh, like uh, the guardian angels working overtime to keep us from, you know doing stupid things <laughs> do you guys put up game cameras on your place or have you have you done that yeah we have done that we yeah we have and, but we and, uh, we have sorry, go ahead. We, but we didn't ever see i haven't ever you know captured any evidence on film with other than that one um, when we were camping uh we haven't come across any footage that looked like it could be that yes yeah. yeah, hopefully that hopefully one game one camera i'm hmm? oh, sorry oh, i was gonna say i was gonna ask the one game camera you guys put up you guys had something in it how high off the ground did you guys place that the camera probably is i know that one that would we put up that there was something on it was probably about six foot off the ground oh, that's a good height yeah because if you put it too low you're gonna get the little there'll be a lot of little animals maybe but i guess if you're trying to capture something walking mm -hmm. let's say maybe put it four or five foot if you're trying to but maybe where it would go from the ground up you know where you get um footage in case you see something you might no telling what you'll see go go through the soil oh, yeah yeah, we, we yeah we have a lot of cameras we put for the Bluff Creek project, and I like to put them up high, looking down. And some of my partners says, "Oh no, don't do that. You got to put them low." So what we do is we put them in different locations. Some areas 
off the main game trails. We get a lot of action. We'll put them low. And mm -hmm. like when I did a lot of uh, investigative work, we, well, I like to put them up because people don't look up. So you put them up looking down, got a lot of stuff that way too. But it really affects the triggering mechanism when it's up in the air shooting down. But, but yeah, I guess it depends what you want to capture. Right. And, and do you do any re any recordings, the sound recordings up there? Do you get anything interesting with sound recordings? The only time I really capture anything on with sound is when we were filming my documentary because I was had the camera mm -hmm. going and we were running. We had the dog trail of something that was making a screaming noise throughout and it echoes see on the water sound travels so you it sound like it was closer than it probably was but the dogs you know we did have some dogs chasing like trying to track something but it came to water and we lost the they, i guess they lost the scent but um that's the only thing on can't like ha actually captured it while we were filming um that one time but uh, I heard something the other night close to my house. I said, I wish I had my kid. But it, well, I don't think it was that. I think it was some kind of bobcat or something mating. Mm -hmm. like, well, they say it sounds wow. like screaming. And I thought it was somebody. And I went and got my son. I said, come out here and hear this thing. And he's like, that's probably either a, a cat, a big like some type of bobcat or maybe one of them black panthers. I don't know. But mm. I said, I wish I had a thought to go grab my camera to, you know, but it, by the time I'd have got out there, it stopped already. But it for a while, it went off a few times. I was like, what in the world? But this oh, yeah. that neighborhood, but actually we live with the swamp surrounds this neighborhood. So you never know. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I, I, at work, I worked for state parks and I, I had to respond to a rape in progress call. And uh, so we went code three, got there, hiked the trail at night and talked to the reporting parties. And, and, and their description was, yeah, they heard this woman who was screaming at the top of her lungs. And then they heard this male's voice that shut the frank up. And they thought it was definitely a rape in progress. So they, they called 911 and we responded. So I got there, got some basic reports. And I went hiking down the trail. It's a trail that's up the upper campground down towards the river. It's about a mile long. So I was hiking that and I intermittent the light because I, I kind of wanted to hear to see where I was at. So I was going down there in one section, about halfway down, the hair in my neck just stands straight up, you know. Turn my light, look around, see nothing. And then I get the call. Hey, come back up. I think we can know what's going on. So I, I go hiking back up the trail, get to the same spot. And hair stands up again, turn the light, look around. And it's the same tree. You know, like, oh, something's wrong with that tree. Hike all the way up, talk to the reporting party again. And what it was, it was a it was a mountain lion in heat, screaming and yelling. <laughs> and, and then a guy about a few sites down, we had been drinking a little bit. And he keeps saying, shut the F word up. Uh and <laughs> so there's your rape and barber skull. So the next day, I was curious as to what it was that made my hair stand up about halfway down the trail. So I went back during the daytime, and you could see much better, you know, looking around. And it got to this one spot, and it was a it was large, it was like a large madrone. Wow. And I'm looking up in there, and uh, noticed some little foot impressions down at the bottom. They were mountain lion tracks. So I had walked under this tree when the cat was in it. Oh my god! Then walk back under the tree when the cat was in it. And they, they didn't even see it. <laughs> and wow. That's a, that's my rape in progress call. And it, <laughs> thank God it was just a mountain lion in heat. Yeah. Uh, and I I didn't see it. You feel it? Very you loose. notice it? It's something different. Yeah. You can feel it. Yeah, you, since you experience it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's being a, that's like being in tune to what's going on, which is pretty important. It's like if you're responding to a problem, your your little spidey senses are going crazy. You're listening to every detail, every sound. You're looking, you're smelling as you go, and then you start picking up on these things that are that are different. And that's mm -hmm. kind of a yeah, it's kind of a way we should be when out, outdoors. Should be paying attention to all those details and those sounds, smells, those feelings. I think they mean something, and. Uh, mm -hmm. You've probably been at it a few times and you started getting those feelings like you're being watched. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot <laughs> out there. Yeah. 
even in this neighborhood sometimes and because I got woods around on each side and if I get out of my car and go into I just look over in those woods thinking hopefully you know it's not something's not in those woods waiting to jump on it so, yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of creepy but oh hey uh, do you walk around at night or are you paying to stay home do I walk around I don't not really around here no oh no. Okay. I mean, yeah. I do when I was younger, not, you know, but I don't, I don't really do it too much now. I mean, my, my yeah, I can lives close, like I could walk to my sister's house around the corner. My brother lives around the corner and we're very close, but at nighttime, I don't know that I would, because there's a lot of woods before we get. I would get there. So unless I had someone with me or, you know, a big dog I could take with me or something. There you go. That's, that's yeah. My dog doesn't listen very well. Just want to stay on the leash. So that would be my last, my last partner on those trails. Hey, I got a couple of last questions to ask you. Um, when would you say the last uh, report or somebody reporting an encounter in your area? How, lo how long ago would that be? Well, Exciting report i would say i had uh, someone contact me probably six months ago but i don't know that he was telling the truth or not because mm. he told me this crazy story and he like it sounded i was like if this is true this would be you know he claims he was in a deer stand and he had those night vision goggle things on and he said he saw this thing like an ape like man looking thing that was under down below him and he said he yelled at it because it was like going to come up the tree and it was going to keep, keep coming so he shot it and it ran off and he, first he said it screamed out and blood was everywhere and it took off running and I said he and he was going on and on about all. And he said, "I want he goes. I'll take you out there. I want to. I want you to get in touch with someone that could. Because he said I want to have the. Uh, he wanted like to be the one. He said, "You're. I'm not taking you and showing you where this is. I'll have to blindfold you to take you there because I want. I want <laughs> them to pay me for it. And I went. He said, I'm the first one who wow. I actually shot it. He goes, I'm going out there to get it." we're going to follow the blood trail. And I says, well, if you get something, you, you know, I said, and then he did, he never he said he was going and now he wouldn't answer none of my calls when I kept calling him to find out to first see if he was full of, you know, if it yeah. was real or not, he sounded like it, he was very, you know, excited about it and telling me this crazy story. But yet when I, calling back to try to verify and, and did you get any more evidence or, and then he doesn't answer. And I said, well, maybe he went back and it got him. Well, if he, should, if he didn't kill it, <laughs> there you go. Like, that's why he hasn't called me back. So that was, and I tried to contact his brother who lived in New York. And, Cause I, this was someone I knew and he's always out in the swamp. He grew up out there and, and he, he goes deep in the swamp. So he's in. So I said, it's possible because this particular person, he's had crazy stuff happen to him. And this would be something if it's going to happen to anybody would be him. But then he's disappeared and he won't call me. And his brother's like, he, he hasn't even answered me. I'm like, so either he was just lying. So that was about six months ago. But before that oh. crazy story, um, the the more serious, you know, where I actually talked to the person was probably in um, a few years ago that they saw something going through the uh, dumpster. It was a dumpster close to hunt, like this, a store that's close to hunting out in the swamp, but not, it's, uh, it's more down by Indian village area where those swamp tours and all are, but there's a, uh, it, the honey Island kind of, backs up against where the store is and they claim they saw something like that digging through the dumpsters late at night that was one story and then another one was a, probably about a year before that where um that they just 
there was a guy on a swamp tour and uh he said that his father he had taken his father it was his father for a birthday present on a swamp tour and he talked about uh well this was probably it was it was a few years before that he took his uh father out there and he said the boat captain they were looking Everybody's looking this way as the boat captain was telling them about something going on over here. And there was this smell, this horrible like smell. And people were talking about the smell. And he said, oh, that's just a dead animal in the water or something. And then the guy said he looked off this way where all these old camps were. And he said he saw this thing squatting like and it had its like arm on its leg like that, like it was just gazing across the river. And he said he looked and and they went around the bend and he thought, was I seeing things? And he said he didn't say nothing at the time. But when he got back in the car with his dad, he told his dad about it. And then he got in touch with me because he said, if I tell you, you won't think I'm crazy. And so that was mm -hmm. that was the only, you know, more recent ones that um then, you know, this closer to now than when my grandfather saw it. Okay. How how close how close was that guy to, to it when you saw it? On the boat, that was he, he said when the boat went around yeah. the bend, they the way he said it was probably maybe fifty feet. It wasn't too far away because they were going That's around a boat. And the camps he said it was but like they had all these old camps that were tore up by the storm and it was mm. just sitting down like just like gazing out across the river. River, he said the face had like this leathery looking face, but the eyes, he said the eyes looked sick, like they were yellowish in the in the where the water had been and had the long dingy hair. And so does that fit the description of the uh, the honey monster? Well, my grandfather described the eyes as being big and color, but he, you know, maybe from a distance, you know, they look yeah like amber you know i don't he never really said that was the whites of he just said big amber color eyes with the long dingy hair that hung almost to the ground that was around his face his face was sort of smooth didn't have hair on the face had the big broad shoulders long arms um yeah. the hair was kind of matted you know like you know like it had mud in it but um so a lot of those eyewitnesses describe very similar, like all of them pretty much describe it the same. And what what color hair would would, would probably be the most common? Well, like the what my grandfather was sort of like a grayish black, but that could have been the the mud that dries if it had mud on it that mm -hmm. made it look gray. Um, so then I've heard other people say it had a reddish more reddish tint to it so maybe different times of the year it has i don't know but yeah i can i can imagine like sometimes coloration like you said could be dirt or vegetation or like or sunlight or, hits a certain, certain yeah. way change the or, color. Or, or or algae in some some cases because yeah. it's environment <laughs> So if it's if, if it's a hairy green green monster, you know, it's probably just the algae. Algae blooms in the hair. Got in the moss and the Spanish moss hanging on it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, but the Spanish moss is kind. Is it kind of gray down out your way? Kind of a grayish green, sort of. Gray, pretty. Yeah, it looks gray, but it does have some yeah. green. Yeah, I, yeah. I think I've seen pictures of it. I haven't got out tested it, t touched it, and smelled it, and all that stuff yet. Hopefully in yeah. uh, April. April or May, I'm trying to schedule a, a trip to go visit my cousins in Louisiana. So, South yeah, Louisiana, that moss, yeah, Liberia. That, that moss they say is like an antibiotic. Like you, yeah. like you use that moss and put it in a tincture and make and like alcohol and put it in the refrigerator, and it's a very strong wow. antibiotic. Wow, I didn't know Never that. Heard, did it? And there's another type of moss that grows on the trees. I think it's called usually or something. And it's, they claim that it's a shorter little moss that looks real fuzzy that they say is like very medicinal properties of being an antibiotic. So if you're ever out in the swamp, you need an antibiotic. <laughs> yeah. There it is. 
Yep. Do I boil it or you just eat your bra? They, they, the people that I know use, they put it in like alcohol, like vodka, and put it in the refrigerator and let it sit for a while. And then you could take a little dropper, like if you mm. get feeling sick or whatever, you put it under your tongue or something, swallow it. Oh, holistic medicine. Yeah. <laughs> So just so, there's so much stuff out there that that it's been used traditionally, and we're losing that information. Yep. my my <laughs> cousin found that some of those things they call turkey tail mushrooms, I guess, that are used like that, like has a lot of. He he said he found a lot of them, and he said I think I've found like gold mine out here because he said that one time <laughs> they had some people that came and they were picking. And he he thought, why? Well, wonder why they're 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 so secretive about it. They what they wanted these tight certain type of mushrooms, and but it turned out they use them for medicine. Wow. And very, I guess valuable to those type you know those type of people that um, collect that. So maybe you can take your little box and go collect them and call up a herbalist and see if they might want to get the mushrooms from you but for medicine not not the other kind of mushrooms <laughs> not not hallucinates right not those uh, medical ones you make sure it's the right ones but they grow on oh, the yeah. side of pillow trees and stuff like in up on the trees mm -hmm. and they look like turkey tails that's why i guess they call them turkey tails oh yeah makes sense yeah you, you did a uh you put together a movie. You want to talk a little bit about that? Your your movie you put together a while yeah. back. A documentary, it, the encounters with the honey on the swamp monster. Yeah, um, that was me going out in the swamp when I first got back from California, taking my little home video camera. It was like this isn't no big production or nothing. Bad sound, you know. I didn't have sound equipment <laughs> all that, but I just happened to have the camera and would meet up with someone and ask them to do it let me talk they tell me their story mm -hmm. and so i had probably talked to like 13 different eyewitnesses and then of course i talk about my grandfather's counter and then we had gone out there at night tracking it with the dogs and then when, there was one scene where we come up that night they had a just so happened to have a bunch of teenagers that were sitting around a camp, like a fire at the boat launch. And we pulled up by boat to, cause we'd been hearing that sound, you know, screaming out. So we, and they had their music going on. So we walked up and asked them, turn their music down and, and asked them if they had heard anything. And then all of a sudden, as we're asking them that, that thing made that loud noise and you could hear it. They heard it. And, then they all got in their cars and left, you know. So, you know, just put piecing together different things. So that I, it probably took me a couple months to make it, you know, just doing that, like meeting up with, because we were always, I was always out in the swamp with my family and I always mm -hmm. took the camera. And that's pretty much how I made the film. That was before I got me a better camera. Um, so the qualities, not really good <laughs> i'm sure it's it looks like home video because it was but uh, but it well, was just a, it was just yeah. a matter of being in the right place at the right time and just happen to have my camera with me type of stuff so yeah so no staging going on if that's how no, it is uh, no, that was the real deal it yeah was like, i was just you know when we were out there i said okay let's if we, they wanted to go to someone's houseboat because there was a party going on, I took my camera. And if they had to be somebody there that and started talking about the Honey Island Swamp Monster, I was like, okay, tell me your story. Some of them wouldn't. They would say, I don't want to be on camera. I, I don't want people to think I'm crazy. And But um, most of them would talk. And, and a lot of them seemed very credible. And you could tell when people's telling the truth usually or they're making some like this guy that called me recently about shooting it i don't know he sounded good but it, i until i either see some evidence or hear from him you know i'm just gonna think well he's either crazy and making it up or he disappeared out there too and i'll hear about it later that 
what happened? To, why did he ever come? And well, I know what happened to him. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Get another story right there. Yeah. Well, hey, the last thing I want to ask you too is, uh, you have you have books published. You have a few books out there, and you like to cook. So, uh, you can let our listeners uh, know that there's a few books out there, and where where they can get them. I have. If you go on Amazon.com, uh, you just could Google my name, Dana Holyfield, and it'll you'll see a lot a lot of my book. I have the Swamp Cooking, Swamp Country Cooking, Cajun Sexy Cooking, Mardi Gras Cooking. Um, I did, I've written some children's books like the little Bayou mermaid and, um, the very hairy, scary honey on swamp monsters, a, a children's version of the story r- told in rhyme. And I illustrated the book for kids, you know, based on the legend of the honey on swamp monster. And then I, d- I wrote a, a children's, it's more like, it's not really just for kids. It's a short novel. The Mysteries of Honey on Swamp, which is really based on my experience growing up as the granddaughter to the local monster hunter and how I had to prove, you know, that that he wasn't he didn't hoax the sighting. And so the kids get together and they go in search of their own, ev- you know, to find new evidence. And of course, they go out there and all kinds of they get in all kinds of dangers. <laughs> so that book um, was kind of based on real life experiences when I was a kid growing up knowing my grandfather had seen this creature. And then, you know, some of the locals, the skeptic people were like, ah, he's, that's just a hoax. So, you know, and then the story, the, the, the school bus bully breaks the track and then then she has to go out and pour another one. And, um, and then she has a kind of an account of her own, (laughs) which made, you know, but in it's, a lot of it's fiction, but it's based on real life experiences. Oh, those are the best ones. Like I, I do fiction and I do nonfiction. And it's like, like I tell people like my, 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 uh, my fiction reads like, like real life because a lot of it is real life because you take those experiences and you expand upon them and you get a lot of facts intermixed with them. That's, that's the only way to write it. That's but the only my, way to write it. Yeah. My uh, website I have honeyonswampmonster.com okay. and danaholyfield.com or two of them that they could find those type of, and then this cook, cooking, I have a swamp, swampbooks.com and that'll have all my, you know, all the cooking books on it. Yeah. So I, I went out before our interview, after I talked to you a while back, I went over and I, it's just, I wonder how many books you did write because I write, I write too. I like to do fiction, nonfiction. And and I, here's a list of stuff you've been busy writing, and it's good to share. You cooking, I like eating, so it's perfect. And it's like that was cool. Those and, and the other ones there, and also here it's like a, a list of a, uh, I mean a list of programs you've been on, like Travel Channel, Discovery, History Channel, Monster Quest, Swamp People. You talked about that a little bit. Uh, mm-hmm. Kennedy's America. I mean, the list goes on and on. You know, mysteries, mysteries at the museum. I think I might have even seen that one when they were talking about for the mysteries at the museum. Mm-hmm. So yeah. you've been busy. Yeah. The, I get contacted by anytime there's a sh- TV show that comes in and they want to do something with the honey on the swamp monster. They usually get in touch with me for an interview. So I'm kind of like the swamp, swamp monster guide. <laughs> but I said, I'm going to do Perfect. my own show. <laughs> you know, I thought about doing a, um, I would like to have done like where I take guests on a private swamp tour down through one of them at night and do the show while we're going through the swamp at night with the ambiance of the swamp and the i thought that might be cool <laughs> but oh. never got yeah working on the big boat to, um my son's been working on a boat that maybe one day we'll do that oh that'd be great and then you feed them you can talk about yeah, all the have- recipes yeah i want to take them out yeah yeah i want to have like a houseboat rent where they could stay on the houseboat at night you know we take them to the houseboat you know after we do a one, little tour and then feed them some crawfish or some fish or alligator and then it's kind of like a bed, bed and breakfast except it'd be a bed and supper i guess when they have <laughs> fish at night and that was one of my things i you know a few years back i wanted to do i just haven't really had a chance to make it i did get a boat that 
my son's been remodeling and building and I bought some star phone blocks off of a Facebook marketplace that's sitting in the yard that I, you know, we keep talking, we're going to build the houseboat eventually. And so. Well, maybe- that's good. I mean, you're right there at ground zero for it. And you have, you get, you got the environment, you know, the area. And I think that's great. That'd be, a, I think people would love to participate in that. I think that would, that's, that's a hit. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Well, any any last words? Anything? Yeah, any advice for anybody who wants to go out to the middle of the swamps to go look for some? Yeah, you better bring some mosquito spray, <laughs> snake boots. Um, I would bring flat. You know, have a flashlight for sure. A couple of them maybe, and just keep your eyes open and be careful. Very careful. Yeah, and bring a buddy. Bring somebody with you. Um, Maybe get a local tour guide that, you know, someone knows the area that, that could take you in there so you don't get lost and could get you out. Yeah. I, don't know if yeah. You do that. <laughs> I have a few friends that could probably handle that. So for you, <laughs> like, take, oh, like you need a, a swamp guide and a pro, you know, I have some friends that when people come from out of town that they have a, a some, a boat, a larger boat, and they've taken some, some friends on a, you know, or when film crews come, I like let them take them out there in their boats. And, and my son is given private tours, like just some friends from California I actually came a few years ago and, and he took them on a little tour in a flat boat going where those big tour boats can't go like really small air, like narrow sloughs where you kind of got to duck to go under the trees and, Mm-hmm. Got to watch the wall. Oh, watch for the wolf's nest out here because they got during spring and all of the you got their big, big wolf's nest. If you bump one of those, you'll probably have to jump in the river. With and the then alligators. They hornets nest too. Don't go up and touch no hornets nest because they they're real pretty hanging in a tree. Some people don't know what it is, and they'll want to go up and touch it. <laughs> so yeah, it's not a good. <laughs> That's a recipe for disaster right there. Yeah. You, you bump the hornet's nest and you jump in the water with the alligators and the, and the, and yeah. the, and the, and the cotton mouse and the cupboards. Yeah. All right. Had a few snakes fall in the boat with us, but. <laughs> but the uh, worst thing here, I, I'd rather a snake fall in the boat, but a big, big spider, those spiders, that are, those big hairy spiders on the trees. <laughs> That yeah. like, but well, it sounds like an adventure for sure. Mm-hmm. Hey, all right, Dana, thank you so much, Dana Hollyfield. Thank you so much for 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 interviewing and let us chat with you and sharing some of your some of where you live and some of your experiences. And uh, I, it's a different perspective of, of looking for Bigfoot, which basically is you're out in the woods and you're at different geographic areas and experiencing the wildlife and and hearing the stories and uh, uh, it's cool. I'm excited. And uh, I want to thank you for your time. Oh, you're welcome. And I enjoyed it. Nice talking to you. All right. Take care.